Welcome to Roundabout Oxford, a podcast from the University of Mississippi Libraries. My name is Christina Streeter, and if you can't already tell from my accent, I'm not a Mississippi native. I was raised in Northwest Michigan on a small produce farm owned by my father and uncles. Our house sat squarely in the middle of an apple orchard. Every September, I would walk into our backyard and have my pick of apple varieties. Granny Smith's, Red Delicious, Gala's, John Gold. Our family could count on those trees to bear fruit every year, unless it happened to be a bad year. A bad year meant a late frost, a windstorm, or maybe a produce disease, even insect infestations. Farmers are always just one disaster away from losing an entire crop and a few disasters away from losing the actual farm. On this episode of Roundabout Oxford, we delve into how food unites and divides. Abby Norris discusses locally sourced foods with Chicory Market co-owner John Martin. Alex Watson talks with Professor Katerina Pasadoma to discuss challenges facing Southern food studies and food systems. American Studies researcher Frankie Barrett discusses dollar stores, and I sit down with Chloe Grant to talk about the rebranding of the UM Food Bank and how they are fighting against the stigma of food insecurity. internet is rife with foodie influencers. Recipe blogs, dessert Pinterest boards, even celebrity chef Instagram accounts, all of them feed our love for all things food. But when you pick out a recipe for tonight's dinner, do you even consider its origin story? Or how about when you're grocery shopping? Each sweet potato, each package of chicken wings, each frozen pizza was harvested or processed by countless human hands. What are their stories? In her first interview, Alex Watson sits down with Professor Pasadomo to discuss Southern food, its complex past, and its present. Hello, my name is Alex Watson. I am an associate professor and librarian at the J.D. Williams Library. And I have today a guest to talk with us about Southern foodways. Would you go ahead and introduce yourself with your full name and title? Sure, thanks, Alex. Uh, my name is Katerina Pasadomo. Um, I am the Southern Foodways Alliance Associate Professor of Southern Studies and Associate Professor of Anthropology. Why don't you go into a little bit about what Southern Foodways means at the University of Mississippi? Yeah, okay. So there's a lot of backstory to that term, uh, specifically at the University of Mississippi. Um, So we have to go all the way back to 1999 with the founding of the Southern Foodways Alliance, an organization that is an institute of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture here at the university. The Southern Foodways Alliance has a mission to document, study, and explore the diverse food cultures of the American South. Southern food studies is something that can be very critical of the stories we Uh, hear and tell about uh, the region and the food that is produced and and consumed in this region and has been um, historically. So as a scholar, I see Southern food or food more broadly as a way into conversations about social history um, and power and culture and various manifestations of culture. Um, So as a scholar, it's really not just about the food at all. It's about what the food can tell us about who people are and how they understand themselves and their relationship to place and to other people, um, what they care about, what they fear, um, et cetera. So I could go on and on. (laughs) So you mentioned using food as a door to uh, opening conversations. Is that in the vein of, hi, I would like to talk to you about food, only food, (laughs) This isn't going to be anything big or political. And yet, 
by its very nature, it winds up telling you a lot about society and people and political structures and power while giving you sort of an in to talk about those things in a way that doesn't make people tense up. Am I reading that right? I think that was probably true when, when the SFA was founded 20 years ago. And I think uh, increasingly, though, there's a much broader uh, understanding within the general population and certainly within the academy that food is connected to everything that, that people do and that the way that food is produced is obscured for most of us. We don't really understand that process. The more we learn about it, the more we see that it's pretty ugly and exploitive. Um, so I think there's a much broader general understanding that when we talk about food, we really uh, very quickly should be moving away from largely celebratory stories. I understand that within the general population, that's not typically the case. But in just you know the decade that I've been teaching courses about food, I will say sort of anecdotally that it is much more common now for students to enroll in a class that has food in the title, expecting some critical analysis, right? Expecting that, you know, I used to think if I had food in the title of a course, I would sort of hook students who uh, were not expecting to um, examine uh, social problems in, in a deep and critical way. Um, and there are still plenty of students who, who, uh, <laughs> who are hooked, right, in that sense. But, I think a lot of students already understand um, the, the embeddedness of food within systems of power and, and oppression specifically. Um, increasingly, people come to the work of the SFA expecting um, critique and not just celebration of food. Do you believe that that change in attitude is due in part to the work that you and other scholars have been doing? Well, I can't take any credit for it, but I do think that, um, you know, scholars have been sounding the alarm for a much longer time than, than probably popular culture and popular media. But I think the work that the SFA does is much more broadly consumed than, you know, academic articles that I write. <laughs> That's just the sort of sad reality of um, writing for academic audiences. So I'm really inspired by the work of scholars who are, um, you know, publishing in, in popular presses or writing op-eds and are using their scholarship to um, reveal sort of injustices in industrial uh, food labor, for example, or all along the, um, the food labor chain. So it's much uh, easier now as just a, a regular person who doesn't have a job as either a student or somebody working in a university to understand a little bit better where our food comes from and how problematic a lot of the processes are that bring it to us. Um, and not just you know, in the present day, but that our food system is embedded in legacies of, of racism and colonialism and exploitation of land and labor. You know, a lot of people have, have known those things and have been saying that for a very long time, but I think just like you know, the broader culture is, um, I think, coming to, I hope, a, a, a more clear awareness of the embeddedness of racism within our society. I think along with that coming to awareness, we see a better understanding of how the food system functions and how that it, its functioning is actually pretty dysfunctional, <laughs> right? It's pretty exploitive. Since you mentioned talking about those structures of power and the embeddedness of food within those power structures, um, would you care to uh, elaborate, give us maybe perhaps a, a mini overview of something you might discuss in greater length on your class about how that looks through the lens of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture and the SFA, that sort of milieu that you find yourself in? Sure. Well, if we think of um, food as a, an agricultural product um, and more recently an industrial product, you know, it doesn't emerge without the labor of, of human hands um, that have, have labored to produce that food. Food system labor in this country and around the world has been exploited and has been performed by people who are undervalued in society. The, this country's founding on uh, colonialism and the theft of land from indigenous people and the forced 
um, enslavement of Africans throughout the colonies and into the 19th century, um, that legacy is, is really central to our understanding of what Southern food is today. Right. So if we think of, you know, ingredients or dishes or preparations that are um, emblematic of, of the South, whether they're greens or fried chicken or corn, right, um, these things are a product of, you know, as one narrative goes, of a sort of harmonious blending of cultures, right? They're people coming together and, and cultural contributions coming together to create something that no one cultural group had created previously. But from my understanding and my, what I teach is that if we're really honest about what Southern food is, Southern food is a product of colonialism, of enslavement, and of the continued exploitation of food system labor. Um, so whether we look at you know, uh, chicken processing plants in Mississippi or tomato fields in Florida, these are places where workers are um, subjected to tremendous risk and are um, underpaid. Um, you know, I think there, there, are, there are so many examples, but I think in teaching um, Southern food as it exists today, I think it's really essential to ground our interpretation of, of Southern food and Southern food ways in the 21st century in a deeper understanding of where they come from in, you know, our, our recent past. Um, and that past is pretty ugly. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty destructive. So situating fried chicken, not just as a food staple for people, but also looking at the systems that provide it. And perhaps to choose a Mississippi specific example, that um, chicken processing plant that was in the news a few months ago for um, getting a whole bunch of people infected with COVID due to their um, lax uh, safety protocols for those people. That's right, exactly. Yeah, so chicken, you can tell a whole, a whole lot of stories about, about labor through chicken. And they're not all bad, right? There's um, Psyche Williams Forson has a really fabulous book called Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs. And the, the sort of subtitle is Black Women, Food and Power. Um, and she sort of shows the ways in which chicken has been a tool for um, Black women historically to um, make some money, you know, on their own. Um, and this is going back to the time of enslavement, right? So there are some sort of um, redemptive or uplifting uh, stories that can happen on the margins, you know, so that's one version of a story you could tell using chicken. And then, yeah, we can come to the poultry plants here in Mississippi, where we had ice raids um, almost exactly a year ago. And now we have outbreaks of, of a virus in a community that is deemed essential, which we really need to interpret as expendable right? Their labor is essential, but as human beings, I don't think we're treating them uh, as, uh, and I mean we, like, as, as eaters, consumers, people who vote, etc. Um, I think we're treating them as expendable, actually. That is quite fascinating, um, especially since when you think about it, how many people who are considered to be essential workers right now are actually involved in one of those chains in getting a food product from its initial source into the hands of consumers. Everything from the poultry workers, as you say, to the person who is doing um, checkout or curbside at uh, Walmart or Kroger. Exactly. Um, and I think it is important to, to really contemplate the labor and the value of individuals who are putting their lives on the line, literally, in this moment, every day, so that the rest of us can eat. Um, in, in, in one way, I do think that this pandemic and this crisis has forced many of us to be more mindful of that labor, because, you know, we are reading more stories about um, outbreaks at pork and poultry plants, for example. Um, and in, in agricultural fields, there have been a lot of outbreaks as well. And if we have to contemplate a world in which people aren't doing that labor, it's terrifying for us, right? What does that mean? And how are, I don't think very many of us can subsist <laughs> um, without the labor of people all throughout what scholars call the food system, right? So, and I think that word is, is really important to include here, right? To think about food 
not just as a product, which is how we, you know, most typically encounter it, but as, as a process. It's part of a, a really deep system that is connected to other systems. And as people who study food, it is our job to help our students uh, better understand the complexity of the food system, as we're discussing here, specifically the tremendous labor that is involved at every stage of food production, distribution, consumption, waste, disposal, right? You have um, people laboring in each of those areas. Well, thank you so much for agreeing uh, to speak with us. We've uh, really enjoyed talking with you, and hopefully you have given us some, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, food for thought. <laughs> I've never heard that pun before. <laughs> I'm sure this is the very first time. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. It's really been an honor. Our next interview brings us back home to Oxford, and specifically the local food scene. Abigail Norris talks with John Martin, co-owner of Chicory Market. John talks about why his family moved back to the South to manage a small grocery store and explains why sometimes there is value in paying more for food. I'm John Martin. I opened Chicory Market with my wife, Kate Bishop, uh, about three years ago. It was three years ago, June 22nd or 21st. I can't remember which. We reopened what had been a market in the space. Uh, it's been a food space in Oxford for over 30 years. And it's also been a community space where people from all different backgrounds, uh, the university, locals, all different races, socioeconomic levels have come together to uh, shop around food. So we took it over because we were interested in food, but more importantly, we were interested in preserving that kind of space in Oxford, uh, where all are welcome and all can celebrate uh, food. And can you tell me a little bit more about uh, the original market and why you decided to take it over? So it started, I don't know what year it opened, but the building's an old gas station, apparently. And it, it, uh, a man named Berlin Hollowell opened it as a kind of a farm stand uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and he sold the produce that he grew and that friends grew. And then he also had some trucked in. Uh, and then our friend Liz Stagg and her husband Frank uh, reopened it. They turned it into more of a, of a grocery setting. Uh, they weren't just, they were carrying local produce still, but they were also carrying things like, um, you know, canned soups and meats and, um, you know, hummus and things like that, serving a, a pretty diverse uh, uh, customer base from the, the locals. The neighborhood tends to be mostly African American, the university community, the Latino community, there are a lot of Mexican um, products that's when it really became this very kind of vibrant uh, community-based space that we knew. Uh, my wife, Kate, is from here originally, so she's an Oxford native. I'm from North Carolina originally, uh, so I'm a bit of a transplant, but um, I had met Kate and we moved to the Delta. She did Teach for America down there, and I was working for the Greenwood Commonwealth and then later Delta State. And that's where we really became interested in food from a policy perspective. We were struck by the, the paradox that the Delta was uh, some of the most fertile land on earth, and yet nothing was grown there commercially that, that you can really eat. You know, it's all commodity crops, soybeans, uh, feed corn, and, and cotton, of course. Uh, and yet it had this health crisis. Uh, it was a food desert. Um, so we, we started to think about, well, what if you grew food locally here and fed people and subsidized that instead of, you know, crops that were grown that had no real local value to a broad segment of the population. And then we eventually landed in the Northeast. We both went to grad school in the Northeast. We kind of got stuck up there and Baltimore and New York City for about 10 years. And we, our backgrounds aren't in food, but we started volunteering around food. We got really interested in the farmer's market scene up in New York and, and community supported agriculture. 
And so we kind of, uh, it became kind of a hobby of ours. And when we, we were always looking for a reason to get back down here, and we heard Liz was closing the farmer's market grocery. It was, it was a space that we didn't want to see disappear in Oxford because Oxford is changing so fast. And there are these kind of places that make Oxford Oxford and, you know, make it a little funky that we believed in preserving. Um, and so Liz kind of coaxed us back down and, and we ended up taking over for her um, in 2017. And so in that, in those 12 years we were away, when we came back, you know, we were really blown away by how much the local food scene had grown. You know, there was this kind of generational shift where there, there have been some kind of old school farmers who are still farming and that we were, sort, we were able to source food from because that's who Liz worked with. But then there were younger farmers who ha believed in, the idea of local food and, and what it does to, you know, keep resources in the community and employ local people and how it can be a, a, a economic uh, engine. And then if you go to the community market, which is, some, you know, the community market, the Midtown Farmers Market is also something that kind of happened in the last 15 years or so. And so those uh, have grown their presence here in Oxford and Lafayette County. And, and there's so many other small farmers there, you know, it's really just kind of blossomed, not because of the market, but in, in advance of when we opened the market. And all we've done is kind of provided the platform for them to come and, you know, give them the opportunity to, to connect to the, the local consumer. Do you think there's anything specific about Oxford and the surrounding area that helps make chicory a success? Yes. I, it's the combination of Oxford still being a small town and having the university here, which provides kind of the cultural presence. So it's this combination of having, you know, kind of a local clientele that's looking for, you know, that connection that we used to all have to the land, you know, and, and, and buying homegrown tomatoes and fresh produce that's grown locally by people they know. But then also having, you know, the, I think the university community adds a certain sophistication to the marketplace. Um, so they're looking for things that you might find at a natural food store. But because Oxford is still a small enough place, we don't have that natural food competition that you might have with Whole Foods or Fresh Market. Um, so it's this very kind of sweet spot. One risk you take is, you know, do you start a market and then, you know, have Whole Foods or another grocery move in, uh, Trader Joe's or whatever. Um, but uh, we don't think Oxford's quite there yet demographically. So hopefully, you know, we can continue to build our loyal customer base that wants to buy locally and, uh, and stay in the game. You mentioned that you worked in policy. Um, I'm interested to know what role do you think local grocery stores and farmers markets play in addressing food inequities and and access to food for everyone in the community? Well, there's, there's kind of two sides of it. There's the consumer side, and then there's just the local economy. And I think, you know, local businesses and, and especially food businesses have the, the potential to strengthen the local economy. You know, we, we pay taxes here, buy food that's produced here, that's grown here. We buy food from businesses that employ other people. We employ local people. So, you know, even though I think we have about 20 employees now at the market, uh, which has grown a lot in the last three years. But if you think about the economic impact of, of when you shop at Chicory Market, you're not only supporting the people who work at the market, you're, you're supporting the people who farm the food and who you know bake the um, cookies in these other businesses so the that impact is magnified locally and all those people you know shop here and pay taxes and so there's this whole economy that's supported by shopping at the market so we have three a three-part mission one is to support the local food economy farmers and food makers two is 
to build community around food. And three is to um, improve access to healthy local food for people of all income levels. And for us, that third part is, is one of the things we really believe in the most, but it's also one of the trickiest things because local food is, is, is grown by, you know, people who are being paid more of a living wage. You know, you're not relying on these factory farms that take advantage of, you know, labor that's, that's, you know, migrant labor or sometimes not even paying, you know, the, the labor in a fair way. So the, the cost of our food is more expensive because of that. We're able to be competitive on the produce side uh, to some extent with Walmart and Kroger, but we also don't want to undercut the farmer. So it, sometimes it's hard to provide, you know, local food to people of lower income levels in a way that they can afford. So some things we do to make up for that is we accept SNAP and EBT benefits, food stamps. Uh, and we do have probably 2% of our clientele pays uh, with EBT cards. So that's one way that they can, you know, use their dollars to, to buy local food and, and you know, support a uh, healthier lifestyle. The other way is that the, the more we buy, the, the better deals we can get with farmers. So the, the more people shop with a, a local food business, the more affordable it's going to be, the more sustainable it's going to be for all of us, the people working in local food, the people buying and, and consuming local food. But it's this whole kind of push and pull and balancing act. And uh, we really do rely on the kind of goodwill and and the choices that our customers make because you know a lot of times it's the choice between I'm gonna go, you know, drive to Aldi and Tupelo and get 99 cent milk and, and really budget shop and support a business that's probably sending a lot of that tax money back to Germany or to, in the case of Kroger to Cincinnati. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna pay more for my food because I know that that dollar is going to lift all of us up in this community because, you know, I'm paying local people and I'm improving the tax base here. So it's a pretty complex issue. The other thing we fight is just the, the, the farm bill aspect of, of the way agriculture is in America. The farmers that we're supporting don't get the kind of government support that the big factory farms get. If we saw that, then a lot of these these economic issues, I think, would be easier to tackle for small businesses like ours. I guess one of my final questions is how can people get involved in their local food communities? And do you have any recommendations that are specific to Oxford? I think there's several ways. I mean, I, I think shopping at the local farmers markets, the community market on Tuesdays, uh, the, the old armory pavilion and the Midtown market on Wednesdays and Saturdays, you know, in, in terms of being a, a consumer of local food, that is, is the most sustainable thing you can do, you know, because you're paying the farmers directly. So buying local food is probably the first step. Uh, volunteering at some of those organizations I think is is a second step uh, we have a community garden in Oxford and I know a lot of people that's another thing that the pandemic has inspired in a way kind of a silver lining um, there's several silver linings because one is the farmers are doing great because people are you know realizing that they can get food locally that's better and more more reliable in terms of sourcing but also people are growing their own food. And so that's important. Um, I think supporting restaurants that source locally. Um, so places like Tarask and St. Leo's. I, I, I really do think though that, that part of supporting local food is realizing that there's value in paying more for your food or maybe, you know, um, changing your food habits so not being tied down to brands eating seasonally so not craving you know peaches in the middle of winter or or strawberry you know strawberries aren't currently in season but blueberries are you know and learning how to cook in a way 
that supports the, the local economy, you know, so I'm going to substitute blueberries for strawberries or I'm going to eat, you know, more squash and zucchini right now, or, you know, I'm not going to eat tomatoes in the middle of January, you know, when I, when they're not in season, just educating yourself and developing that kind of awareness can make a big difference. We sell local produce uh, and local food 12 months out of the year at Chicory Market. So we, I mean, we basically have a 12 month growing season. So when we talk about eating seasonally, there's things like kale in January and, you know, there's salad greens. Uh, there's a lot of uh, greenhouse farms that grow through the winter. We see a lot of people in the summer because they want tomatoes and okra and, and watermelons. And, but uh, we love, you know, for people to think about local food year round. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to talk to me about this. This has been absolutely fascinating. Yeah, thank you, Abby. up in a small town in western Michigan, it was common for my family to drive 20 minutes or more to get to a grocery store. That's still the case for a number of rural communities around the United States. But these food deserts are just as common in cities as they are in the countryside. I sat down to talk with University of Mississippi graduate Frankie Barrett about the emergence of dollar stores as local food sources and how it affects the communities they serve. My name is Frankie Barrett. I am a current student at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut in American Studies. I recently graduated from the University of Mississippi in the Southern Studies Master's Program. Your Master's of Arts thesis was on a bargain at any cost, the rise of the dollar general. What made you become interested specifically, like what drew you to studying the dollar store industry and how it affects communities and society? Yeah, so it's like actually a very mundane story. I think it's probably twofold in that I was living in Oxford, which is the most rural place I had lived before. I'm from sort of the urban South. I grew up in Asheville, North Carolina. So I was seeing dollar generals everywhere and just sort of like, what's the deal with this? Like what's going on? So that coupled with, I was scrolling through my Instagram feed one day and there was an image of a person from this website that caters to people who identify with queer communities in Appalachia. And it was a person with a tattoo of the Dollar General logo on their chest. And I just was like stumped. I was so curious. I was like, what is going on here? Why is this corporate logo something that like queer and alternative rural Appalachian communities are like reclaiming or repurposing to sort of represent their community building. So I started with that sort of cultural based question being like, let me try and get to the bottom of this. And then the more research I did into the, the business of Dollar General, the history of the business, I was like, wow, there's actually a really fascinating historical story here that kind of brought me more into studying the history of the political economy in the 20th century, which I did not know I would ever be studying, but is now sort of um, where most of my research interests lie. You know, I, I grew up in a very, very small town. Like we had to drive like 15 to 20 minutes away to get to groceries for the most part. Mm -hmm. I've had to rely on these smaller stores and growing up, like I always had warm and fuzzies about like back in the day, I think my mom called them five and dimes, but like I grew up with like Woolworths and like Ben and uh, Ben Franklin's um, in, in small towns near us. And, and I had warm and fuzzies around them because it's kind of like, that was like your nearest toy store. You know what I mean? Or like yeah, where you'd get absolutely. to pick out some candy, those sorts of things. So bargain stores aren't necessarily a new thing, but can you tell me a little bit about like, kind of like what you have found to be like the origin story of these bargain stores? Yeah, I think it's really insightful of you to say that because I do think there's been this sort of impulse in popular media with goods covering dollar stores because they've expanded so rapidly these corporations that like there's like 
wow, we're awakening to a dollar store economy or like newly emerging dollar stores take over the area or something or like, and, and they're often narrated, you know, as like a rural savior, like dollars general sweeps in to provide food access to individuals in need. And while that's not entirely untrue because Dollar General is entering new areas, it was founded, its predecessor was founded in 1939. So it actually has been around for a really long time and started out um, actually buying out um, five and dime stores and general stores that were going out of business. It was a wholesale company, so it would buy out all their old stock and then it would resell it um, or, or help redirect it to other um, brick and mortar stores that could resell sell it. So, it, and it was founded in Scottsville, Kentucky, which was a small town in Kentucky um, by the Turner family. So it was a family owned business um, and it was co-founded with James Luther Turner and his son, Cal, and they were co-operating it for like decades. And it was the slow growing successful, um, at first just wholesale company and then eventually retailer um they opened their first store about 10 years after it was the wholesale company was founded that's not the story we think of when we think of dollar general because when um, the 1970s hit the store grew so rapidly so like i think one of the key research questions that i had and continue to have is what is it about the political economic context starting in the 1970s that made the dollar store corporation the most viable business model for both urban communities and rural communities. And, I, and the answer to that is that its target population is low income communities and predominantly communities of color. So some people shop at these stores because they're bargain stores, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, and cause I've been in, in some of these stores before, some of this stuff does seem like a bargain. And then there's times where I'm like, I know that this is cheaper in another store. Can you talk to me a little bit about, are these really bargain stores? Yes, I think that's a great question. And I think a little bit, it depends on what a bargain means for someone. Um, so whereas like large box stores such as Walmart or Target, these like they create bargains by buying in bulk and offering bulk low like cost cutting prices. So they, you know, have massive things of paper towels that they can sell at a cheaper unit price. And Dollar General is offering the lowest price for a paper towel roll that you will find, but it's not cheaper than the unit price if you're able to buy in bulk. But for folks who don't have the money to put down, uh, like to be able to buy in bulk um, and to be able to, you know, they don't have the upfront capital to save money long term in the same way that they don't have money to invest and earn more money through the stock market. Um, they're also losing money by not being able to invest in the products that they buy. So in only having, you know, the remainder of your paycheck and needing to buy all of the family essentials for the week, you might end up spending 99 cents on a paper towel roll, which like is a bargain if you need a paper towel roll and all you have is a dollar, but could be a cheaper unit price of maybe 69 cents if you're buying a larger package at a large box store. Some of the larger box stores have gotten blamed for um, kind of being putting small mom and pop stores out of business, like locally owned grocery stores. I know places I've grown up in, the large box stores have come in and not very long after you start to see some of the locally owned grocery stores going out of business or just stores in general, um, you know, could be different services or goods that they'd provide that can also be provided through a large box store. But have you noticed any effect on local economies in your research? Have you, have you come across where, Dollar General has either had a positive or negative effect on local economies? Yeah, so if there's one thing that I would say across the board about Dollar General's effect on local communities is that it is very locally contingent on the place histories, the cultural identities of, of the place, and, um, and even sometimes the business strategy varies from place to place. And, and I think a key important thing to know just as background is that Dollar General's business model is reliant on a very like cheap um, construction process and almost like an experimentation phase in a new location. So they open and it's like a test run. And if it's not profitable in the first two or three years, oftentimes they'll just close it down, pack up shop and leave. So that varies, you know, like if, it's successful that might have negative effects on other businesses in the area or positive effects on other businesses in the area. But 
it's not investing in the community in any sort of long infrastructural way. Um, and Dollar Generals are able to do that profitably, that quick open close, because it only costs, it's, I think it's $250,000 on average to open a new Dollar General store. And in contrast, it's around 15 million to open a new Walmart Supercenter. So they can throw up these, you know, no one goes to a Dollar General for the aesthetics of the shopping experience. So you can throw up a Dollar General store, see how it does, and then very easily pack it off, up and send the goods elsewhere if it doesn't succeed. It has whatever effect it has so long as it is a positive effect for the company. Um, and if it's not a positive effect for a company, it will just leave. So that's always gonna have a negative effect on the community to come in and maybe create a dependency to ironically come in to offer more choice, but then eliminate other choices um, and then leave again. Dollar general strategy for different types of geographies varies. So you know, I looked at three different case studies of examples of anti-dollar store activism. So three different cases of communities that organized to um, either prevent a Dollar General from coming to their area or stop the new expansion of Dollar Generals into their area and looked at, at three different locales. One, hyper rural, Dry Creek, West Virginia, a small community. Um, and they had just a, a local locally owned general store still in their community. That was where everyone shopped. There was a family dollar, you know, 10, 20 miles down the road in nearby Beckley. Um, so it wasn't like they didn't have access to groceries or these goods, but they were like, well, if we have this store right here um, in our small town, it, it will have a negative effect on the general store. Um, and so they organized and were able to prevent it. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum is the story of Tulsa, North Tulsa, um, which had a several years long activist struggle to try and get the local government um, the city government to intervene to prevent the hypersaturization of this district's um, retail market with Dollar Generals. There were over, I believe it was over $10 Generals in this one city district um, and no fresh fruit op food options, no full um, supply grocery stores. And so over several years of advocacy about like the negative effects on the community, eventually the city did put in place an, a temporary ordinance that then became permanent that there's a process for approval that has to happen before new construction can happen on a small box discount store. But that was a struggle of many years and there isn't yet, or at least there wasn't yet as of the end of 2019, a fresh grocery store that had yet entered the retail market because there are just so many dollar stores. So it kind of just like forced out every other thing. Um, that I think brings up another really important point, which is that there is a correlation between um, especially in urban contexts, communities of color. North Tulsa is a predominantly black community, historically so. It's the site of the historic Black Wall Street where the, two, the 1921 um, white supremacist race massacre occurred. So this history of these dollar store corporations is really intimately tied also to racism and what a recent scholar, Jerry Shannon, just published an article last week that had the interesting term retail redlining. And he's talking about how similar to the housing, um, the way that housing has been systemically discriminatory, so has retail markets. So it's that, that would definitely be another place to look for advanced reading. To anyone who would say, you know, the Dollar General is a necessity and I need to shop there. I would never argue with them because absolutely it's a necessity for a lot of folks. It's the only place that they can go to get their groceries. That being said, I don't think because it's a necessity eliminates the possibility that it's also perpetuating some inequalities in those communities and creating the, the consumer base that it wants. So it's helping reify the systems that have created large low income communities in these areas. One thing that's been on my mind a lot about is with the food scarcity that, you know, these neighborhoods, not that there's no food available necessarily. Yeah. It's just that if, if you have 10 of these dollar stores, but no uh, grocery stores or any way to find a retail store that provides fresh produce um, or options mm -hmm. even, like frozen, many frozen options or shelf stable options that, I mean, you're pretty much dealing with highly processed foods on a regular basis for these, these dollar stores. But can you talk a little bit about like your thoughts on 
the products they have and the nutritional value and how this affects the communities that they serve. I do think one of the steps that the corporation has made is to really lean into this idea of it as a rural savior. And so it's been taking steps to try and diversify its food options. I think it's trying to become like a smaller version of a Walmart super center. I will be curious to see what the like long-term effects of that are because yeah, like you were saying, having a long shelf life is, or, or ha things that have a short shelf life are not the most profitable items to be turning over in a Dollar General store. So I'll be curious about that. The one place where I do see negative health ramifications like within the work that I did was among actually the workers of Dollar General because of the labor conditions of working in retail in that context. Um, there are quotes like the, the documents of the company do suggest that they very intentionally recruit their workers from their target consumer base. So if we want to know how Dollar General feels towards its consumers, we can look to how it's treating its workers because it is perpetuating poverty by paying their workers such low rates um, and intentionally targeting the most vulnerable of these people to work in its stores in such terrible conditions. Getting accepted into college is said to open up a whole new world of opportunity. But a growing number of students in universities aren't just struggling to make good grades, they're struggling to put food on the table. In this last interview, I talk with Chloe Grant about how a campus assistance program has grown and evolved to take the stigma out of food insecurity. I am Chloe Grant. I am the student director of Grove Grocery, which is the name of the University of Mississippi Food Pantry formerly known as the Food Bank. I started working with the Food Pantry my freshman year, just sort of volunteering in my free time. And then my sophomore year, I was the chair of fundraising and events. So I helped them plan a few new events. And then my junior year, I was the assistant director. So I served in a much greater capacity that year. And now as director, I have really just been gearing up over the past couple of months to get ready for all the new challenges that this year is gonna bring. Our main mission is to make significant long-term improvements in people's lives by number one, providing all students, faculty, and staff in need with nutritious food and other essential items. And second, by addressing the underlying causes of hunger on campus. I think it's really interesting because I think a lot of people on campus might not realize that it's not just for students. It really is mm -hmm. for the entire campus community, staff, yes. so employees and included who might exactly, be in need. Yes. When did it first open? Yeah, so it was opened in 2013 by um, a former Ole Miss student. And at the time, it was just called the Ole Miss Food Bank. And how has it progressed over the years? You know, has it changed, you know, you know, purposes, locations, like tell me a little bit about the history um, mm -hmm. and if it's changed much. Yeah, so I would say, um, obviously I can't speak to what it was like um, before 2017, which is when I started at Ole Miss, but I know that in the past couple of years, we've greatly increased the number of students involved. So the food pantry has always been run by an executive committee um, in the past, that's been like a fundraising chair, a marketing chair, a director, and someone to collect the goods on campus and someone to organize the facility. And that was it. And then last year, so the 2019 to 2020 school year, we had roughly 15 students um, plus volunteers running the food pantry. And then this year we expanded a lot. We now have 45 students on the food bank team. Um, plus the volunteers. So we're really trying to get a lot more done and we know that, you know, there's strength in numbers. So we really want everyone to be involved in our work. What drew you to working with this organization? Because there's a yeah. lot of different ways to help out on the campus, but what drew you specifically to food insecurity? Um, to be honest, I lived in Minor Hall my freshman year, which is right next door to Canard Hall where the food pantry is. And I needed um, volunteer hours for the honors college that I'm in. 
And I just thought it would be super convenient because I could walk over and I didn't have a car. Um, and then I just saw that they were doing a lot of good work. And then whenever I would see someone come into the food pantry, I could see the difference that it made in their day. I guess I just had like a vision for it and I wanted to see it happen. Can you talk to me a little bit about the activity you've seen since the pandemic at uh, the food pantry? Yeah, so just since the campus shut down in mid-March, we have distributed um, roughly 8,000 meals to students. So that is from March 16th to August 16th. And additionally, we saw roughly a 300% increase in the number of people that use the food pantry. So from January 20th to March 15th, which was before the campus shut down, we distributed an average of 140 meals per week. And then once the campus shut down, still in the spring semester when students were on campus, from March 16th to May 20th, um, so after the campus shut down, we distributed an average of 426 meals per week. So that's over three times as many per week. Um, so we're really taking a client-centered approach to addressing basic needs and security. So basically that means you know, focusing not just on what people need to survive, but things that they really want. So I like to tell people that we're trying to provide food that you, know, you or I would want to eat. I think a lot of times when people look at a food pantry, they think, you know, canned soup, dried pasta, and that's it. Um, so in addition to providing like the traditional shelf-stable food, we are looking into providing like frozen um, fruits and vegetables. Um, and then we're starting a meal swipe program through this organization called Swipe Out Hunger. So we're able to distribute meal swipes to students. We like that a lot because that's how many students on campus eat. And we sort of want to break down that barrier between the people who can't afford food and the people who can't, you know, because eating on campus is a big part of social life. And also, I think it's just pretty easy to get, you know, if you can go to the Rebel Market and get a wide variety of food versus like dry pasta, especially if you're a freshman living in a dorm, you know, I think being able to eat in the dining hall can go a lot farther. And also, if you're on campus or living off campus and, you know, having to bring food with you, you know, if you don't have refrigeration, that sort of thing, you're mm -hmm. right, it is a huge barrier. And it is Absolutely. a huge barrier socially as well. There are other products available beyond the food as well. What, what else do you have available? Yeah, so we have been providing a lot of cleaning supplies, especially lately um, in the pandemic. Um, we also, because of the pandemic, we've started distributing masks. So we have both cloth and disposable masks to give to people um, because we would hate for someone who doesn't have a mask to have to risk walking around campus and around the community without one. Um, and I know that a lot of businesses don't allow people in, which makes sense for social distancing reasons, but we wanna make sure that that's not a barrier for people who can't afford a mask. We also provide a lot of toiletry items, so like shampoo, conditioner, um, body wash, tampons, that sort of thing. And then usually around finals week, we like to provide extra school supplies, so like scantrons, um, pencils, that sort of thing, to make sure that no one is having trouble in their classes. Can you highlight for us, um, you know, if someone wanted to make some donations of um, products, you know, what is your most requested products, you know, that people could help out with? Um, to be honest, we really prefer financial donations just so that we can have that discretion so that when we are stocking the food pantry, we can just go to Kroger or Walmart and pick exactly what food we need based on our current supply. That being said, we actually have a Get Involved tab on our website that lists all of the food and toiletries and cleaning supplies that we need the most. What do you feel is the biggest challenge that faces the food pantry? I would say the stigma of hunger and basic needs and security on campus because I know one that's a barrier for people because it can I think prevent them from going into the food pantry and then additionally just sort of the psychological toll that that takes on students. I'm glad you brought up the stigma of seeking assistance and how that prevents some people from utilizing this resource because this is an amazing resource but you're right like okay. there's no shame in this. I mean having needs for food. I mean everybody needs help sometimes. So how how does your organization try to overcome that and reach out to students or even employees? 
Yeah. So the biggest thing that we've done recently is change the name to Grove Grocery, um, just because we know that the term food pantry itself can be a bit stigmatizing. So we're trying to sort of still refer to it as that, but also have, I guess, just more, more of a welcoming name for people. And then additionally, in our marketing in general, we are trying to avoid, you know, it's just simple things like putting imagery like canned foods and ramen on t-shirts. You know, we're trying to move more towards produce or like, again, food that anyone would want to eat. Additionally, in the past, we've done tabling, which is where, you know, you literally just go sit outside at a table and talk to students. And we like to ask questions either, you know, like what percent of college students struggle with hunger? Um, or do you think that if you're hungry, that can affect your academic performance? Um, and it's just nice to sort of start that discussion with students on campus. And it's really interesting to see when people come in with like a group of friends because they sort of bounce off each other. And I think they kind of talk about it a little bit amongst each other. So I guess just, um, you know, educating people on campus and then starting a discussion about it. So if someone from the campus community needs <clears throat> access to the food or, or hygiene supplies that the Grove Grocery uh, has in stock, how does this process work? You know, mm -hmm. are they able to just walk in? Do they need to fill out something online? Are there multiple locations? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are located in Kennard Hall, which is the same building as the University Police Department. Our hours change every semester just based on what the community need and the volunteer availability is. Those are always posted on our website and our social media. We also have a grocery order form that people can fill out. So the way that that works is it's a Google form and it lists all of the items that we have in the pantry at that time. And then someone can just fill it out. And then a volunteer will fill their order and leave it outside the food pantry for them. And since Canard Hall is open 24 hours a day, they can just go in and get it even after hours. And then that really works well with social distancing too. And then we also have grab and go bags. So we have recipe bags, which is just a recipe and all the ingredients you need to make it. And then we have snack bags and we leave those outside the food pantry at all times. And then additionally, we provide meal swipes to students. I think it's really important for people to understand one that hunger is common on college campuses and additionally that it's something that everyone can do something about whether it's donating to the food pantry or volunteering or you know just having a conversation with your friends about it that can help reduce the stigma and make you know sort of even if it's a small impact in someone's life if everyone on campus comes together so including the students, the faculty, the staff, and the administration, I think there can really be a change. And, you know, I think the ultimate goal for the food pantry is for us to not be needed anymore, right? Yeah, I mean, your purpose is to hopefully go out of business one day, right? Exactly. So yeah. that's wonderful. Um, I really appreciate the work you do here for our campus members. And um, if people want to get in touch to either volunteer or to um, maybe make a contribution, or uh, even if they need resources, um, can you tell us your website or an email address or any contact information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our website is foodbank.olmiss.edu, and our email address is olmissfoodbank at gmail.com. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Roundabout Oxford was developed and produced by Brian Corrigan, Taylor Fields, Alan Munchauer, Abigail Norris, Christina Streeter, and Alex Watson. 
This episode was narrated by Christina Streeter and Gail Herrera, with musical contributions from Brian Corrigan and public domain music performed by Gail Herrera. Thank you for listening to Roundabout Oxford.